Good morning. There we go. Uh, hey, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you all, not so much uh, for you being here at this church, but thank you so much for being here just to worship our Lord today. Uh, if you are our guest this morning, we want to welcome you. We just thank you so much for being here at Homewood and want you to know that we do have that class. Thank you, Steve, for mentioning that uh, about our Catch the Vision class. You know more about our mission and our vision uh, and what we do here to grow and make followers of Jesus Christ who love, connect, serve. Uh, and that is what we are all about. Um, thank you, Kevin and the praise team uh, for this morning. Uh, and if you were part of our chorus, choir, chorus, I don't know the official word of it last week. Uh, we want to thank you for that, man. Last week's service was great. Um, put a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so if you were a part of Tech Arts, if you were a part of the chorus or the praise team, thank you. Um, these guys put in a lot of work for Sunday morning. Tuesday, Kevin sent me an email and says, hey, we need to know kind of your main topics. And I said, that'd be nice if I knew that too. Um, but he spending the week of figuring out songs that are going to go with this service and that are planned this way. It's not just a Friday night, Saturday night, let's throw some songs together. Uh, they spent a lot of time in our worship service, and we, so we thank you guys for that and your time that you do that here. Um, uh, if you are a guest, I am not our normal preacher. Uh, you can tell with the microphone mess up. Um, my name is Justin Peach. I'm a student minister here. I work with 7th grade through 12th grade. And every now and then, uh, I get a chance to preach to you. And whenever Brett asks, I jump on the opportunity. Brett... Um, Took this past week off. He and his family have been in Tampa on a little family time, little family vacation. Uh, I, Brett's not here, so it's easy for me to do this. But and Brett puts a lot of work in to this church. Uh, and if you know Brett, even just a little bit, you know he's going to do it 110%. Uh, we are blessed as a church to have a preaching minister, lead minister, who uh, prays for us, who loves us here, who puts 100% into being our preacher and our pastor and being here. And so um, every now and then, it's a good time for him to take 110% to be in Tampa and to be at Bush Gardens and to have fun on the beach. Uh, and so he's doing that, or he did this past week. So uh, we're grateful for him to take a little rest time so he can be on fire and more awake for this next series that we are doing. Um, we are starting a new series today uh, entitled All. If you can't see it, surely you can. Uh, and we're going to be looking at Mark 12. Uh, Mark 12, verse 30, for the next four weeks, um, it has been neat to see, it's been great to see Brett going through our upcoming series. Next month, uh, uh, we will be, in May, we will be doing a whole series in Mark, which is, I thought, what we were going to start today. Um, but over the past week or so, or two weeks, actually, probably more than that, Brett has been thinking about, man, we've done such a good series in Unleashed. And we did such a great series in Who's Your One. And then in the wake of last week, in the Resurrection Sunday, uh, um, and Christ uh, beating the tomb and, and, and beating death, he's like, man, I want to go a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper into this. So we're going to be looking at Mark 12. Uh, and when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Um, and so that's what we're going to be in the next week. And I have the privilege of kicking this off and looking at heart today. Um, but if you would, please bow with me a prayer before we get into God's word. God, we just thank you for you know, this beautiful day that you've given us. And God, if it's rain or shine or whatever it is, God, it's still a day that we get to worship you. Uh, and God, I'm just grateful for our church family. I'm grateful for uh, all the volunteers that get here really early uh, to make sure that this day goes smooth, uh, um, and not that we can pat ourselves on the back and see, you know, look what we did, but that we can just help facilitate uh, um, worshiping you uh, in a better way. Uh, God, that's what we strive to do every single day. God, we know that uh, you are a God that knows us and knows us on an individual level. And God, there is a, a, a word, there is a phrase, there is a verse. God, there is something that you want to say to each one of us today. And I pray that we clear our hearts, that we clear our minds. Um, God, that we listen to your message. Uh, God, not my message, but yours. Um, and God, and if I ever go away from your message, cut the mics off again. Uh, God, because we only want to hear you uh, and your message. And we love you so much. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
When I was a kid, I grew up in uh, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, about 30 minutes. Some of you guys know where it's at. It's about 25, 30 minutes east of Nashville. And I grew up in this area called Belinda City. And as a kid, I didn't really understand how big this little subdivision was. And there's like eight subdivisions in one. But when I got older and you start driving through there, and then you go back to see, you know, where you grew up, you're like, man, there's like 8,000 houses in this neighborhood. It's massive. But it was an awesome place for a kid to grow up. Um, it's just one of those neighborhoods where you walk outside and you go, where is everybody? Oh, all the bikes are at Adam's house. That's where everyone's at. And we had about eight or so people on my street that, w that went to the same school as I did. So you just knew the people around you. You knew the kids around you. It was like an open door area neighborhood. Uh, and we really liked that. Uh, and I was grateful that I had so many kids my age on my street that I could play with. We can ride bikes with, we can go in the woods, we can do a ton of things with. But one of the things that I love to do the most is I love to play football. Now, I didn't play organized football um, until I was in sixth grade. I don't know if my mom thought that I would uh, uh, get hurt. Uh, I'm the only child, so she doesn't want her poor baby to get hit by other kids, which is understandable, except for I, I just kind of realized that I was in karate as well which is where you put pads on and just kick each other all the time. So I don't, I don't really get the logic there. But I didn't play football. Um, but I love to play football. I didn't, I didn't understand the rules that well. Right? I, I didn't really understand. As a fourth grader, fifth grader, you don't really understand the rules of football. You just play. You guys might. I did not know the rules. But in about fourth grade, one of my best friends, Darius, uh, started to play peewee. He played peewee football. I was so jealous of Darius. He would come out after practice to play, and he had his football pants on with the big hip pads. And all the, I was like, oh, man, I don't have those. Man, I, I need to get some, some pants so I look official. Uh, but he would come out, and he started to learn the rules of the game, and which meant that I asked him every play, all the time, the rules of football. Uh, when can I do this? How come we can throw it once but not throw it twice? We should be able to throw it as many, well, if you're behind the line of scrimmage and you throw behind the line, then okay, you can throw it. All right, that doesn't make quite sense. I didn't understand the downs. I was like, okay, we got four tries to get 10 yards, but what if I get 12 yards? Then is it first and eight? Or I, 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 didn't, understand, I didn't understand how it worked, that, which would have been hard on math. But I was like, okay, I got it. So every 10 yards, we get that. Look, I, kept, I kept asking him questions. There is every play, and he finally said, hey, hey. For, forget all these rules. The name of the game is I throw you the ball, you run as fast as you can past that mailbox, and don't let anyone touch you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, but what about, can we do like a double, this? he's like, no, you catch a ball, you run as fast as you can past that mailbox, and let no one touch you with two hands. Okay, got it, all right, and so he had to simplify, which people have to do for me my entire life, simplify things for me so I get it on this, here's Catch a ball, you run as fast as you can, don't let anyone touch you. Forget all the other rules, just focus on this one rule. And this is what I see when I look at Mark 12, starting at verse um, 28. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark 12, verse 28. We will be there on the screen. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? This also reminds me of being in college, and um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I had astronomy at 8 o'clock in the morning. There's a lot wrong with that. Well, I don't need to know astronomy, but let's go to a class at 8 o'clock in the morning, and let's turn the lights out and look at stars. Wasn't awake for a ton of classes. But in that class, there was about 150 of us. Right? Just a big class at MTSU. And so we're there at the beginning of the semester, every first three or four classes. Students don't, you go to every class. But the first three or four, there's a lot, there's a packed house. And then the middle, you have a little less people. But then like the last two or three classes, it's 100% attendance because you're going over exam review. Right? And I see this right here in the exam review. Right, This guy says, all these laws, what's going on? Tell me what's going to be on the test, teacher. I need to know what's going to be. What's the most important thing? Just kind of sum it up for me so I kind of get this. Right, 
He says, hey, just get to the point. I don't need to know all the stuff. I just need to know what's most important so I can pass this test. And Jesus in verse 29 says, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus says, all right, I'll give you down to one. I'll tell you the most important one that you need to know. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Jesus takes 613 laws that they had at that time and said, I'll give you one. I'm going to narrow this down to one. This is the name of the game now. You catch the ball, you run past that mailbox, you score a touchdown. He says there's a lot of rules playing, but the name of the game now is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He says this is what we are here to do. And when Jesus said this, as soon as he started off, everyone knew exactly what he was saying. Right? Everyone knew exactly what he was saying. In Deuteronomy 6, you don't have to flip there because it's the exact same verse that we're looking at now, Mark 12. Right? Jesus repeats that in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, and it'll be on the screen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. Jesus quotes the Torah. He quotes Shema, which is hear. Hear, O Israel. When they read this back in Deuteronomy, when they read this a while ago, that was like, hey, pay attention. Listen up, Israel. This is very important. This is going to be on the test. This is very important. You need to know this. Right? And I love how Jesus teaches in so many different ways. He heals people. He raises people from the dead. He answers questions with questions. He tells parables. He writes in the sand. He teaches in so many different ways. But right here, he says, all right, we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to go back to this prayer, to the Shema prayer that they would have said multiple times a day. That they would have woke up in the morning and said this. They would have had this everywhere. Before worship, before meals, everywhere they go, they would would know the Shema. This would be something that they would understand. And I think about our church, and I wonder if we were a church that prayed the Mark 12 prayer, that prayed the Shema, the, the Deuteronomy 6, 4, that we were a church that when we woke up, you had this on a piece of paper in your bathroom as you brush your teeth and you just wake up saying, Lord, let me love you with all my heart, all my strength, all my soul, all my mind. You, go, you get in your car and you have this on a post-it note in your car. When you turn the radio, you pray this prayer. You have it as a backdrop on your phone. When you look to time, you go, oh, I need to love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. This is a church that text this to each other, that posts this to each other. I wonder what that would do for us if we lived this verse out. This is the first thing we think about when we wake up, is God, let us love you more. I love how Jesus breaks this down in Mark 12 into four areas, right? And I've been saying it over and over again, and I will say it in the wrong order over and over again. So, you know, please forgive me if I don't get heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he breaks it down right here into these four He says, if you start with these, if you go to these four things, you're going to be all right. And he says, we're going to break it down to the heart and to the soul and to your mind and to the strength. And what Jesus is asking of us right here is that we give him our undivided love. He says, hey, in everything inside of you and everything you have, you need to give it to him. He says, love me with every single thing that you have, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and calling us to live that way. And I ask the question, I wonder why that he chose the heart. Brett will be looking at the soul, mind, and strength the next three weeks. I'm pretty blessed that I get the first one uh, because I think that I get the most important I really like this idea of the heart. And God in the Shema and Jesus quoting that tells us, love it with your heart because the heart is what drives the body. Talking here and also talking physically, right? 
Your heart is what drives the body. Your heart is extremely important to you. I, I was blessed a few weeks ago. Uh, I did the cool husband thing and said, sweetheart, we're going out to a date night tonight on a Thursday night. Let's go. And she said, well, where are we going? And I said, well, I got a macaroni grill gift card in my pocket. We're going out fancy tonight. And she said, hey, I got the same card. I said, desserts and appetizers on us, right? And so we go to, uh, so we go to macaroni grill. I'm not knocking on them. I really like macaroni grill. Uh, and then we sit there. And you know it's a fancy place when they have the paper over the table, right? And so you get there, and then they have the crayon, and your server writes his name in cursive backwards. It's, it, so everyone tries it for the next 30 minutes by yourself. It never looks that good. But we're sitting at the table, and I ask Mary Beth questions about the heart. Um, and Mary Beth, uh, when she worked at um, UAB here, she was in the EP lab where she helped put in pacemakers and dealt with the heart. When we were in Nashville, she was uh, working at Vanderbilt in the cardiac ICU. She's very knowledgeable about the heart. Um, so I just asked her questions, and for about 15 or 20 minutes, she had her red crayon out and was drawing of the heart, and here's what it goes here, and it pumps it to this side, and it brings it to this side, and it does the triple bypass means, and here's what this means, and this means, and just blew me away at just how intricate and how important the heart is. If your heart is out of whack, you're in trouble. Um, it pumps necessities. It, if your heart is not working, then other parts of your body may not be working right. And so I love that Jesus, that God says, hey, we're going to deal with the most important thing right now, and that's your heart. Um, two weeks ago, I was on some crutches. Um, not now, thank goodness. Uh, I was on some crutches out at Oak Mountain. I've told this story a thousand times. Trip putting some kayaks into the water, and my shin and ankle met the concrete boat ramp. You know which one won. Um, and so I was on crutches for a little bit. Uh, and I was on the ground thinking I broke my leg. I said, well, what do we do? And she said, well, let's, I don't know. And thankfully there was guys there to help me get the kayaks back on my car and strapped on. And we did all that. And then we figured out what to do. And she said, emergency room. And I said, no, let's find an urgent care. There's not one in Chase Lake, like Google says, just to let you know. Uh, but we drove around Chase Lake a few times, and we ended up getting to the one out in Hoover by our house. Because we thought I had a broken leg. It's, it's important, but it's not that important. But if I told Mary Beth, my heart hurts. There's something, I, I, I feel something wrong with me. Oak Mountain would have got two brand new kayaks that day. Because we would have left those kayaks there. We would have hopped in a car, we would have called an ambulance, we would have gone somewhere immediately because your heart is extremely important. And with matters of the heart, with talking about the gospel, with talking about Mark 12, it is, again, seriously important when he talks about that. You know some people, if I say right now, do you know people that love something with all of their heart? You're right now thinking about something. Yeah, yeah, that person loves that with all their heart, right? And it may be God. It may be something else. Uh, moving down here uh, from Nashville to Alabama, uh, you guys like your football. Uh, two teams, really. Um, not Troy and UAB. Uh, you guys like two teams. And you guys know some people or have seen some people that love your teams. I I'm trying not to step on any toes, guys. I'm being very careful with the words I say. Uh, but you guys love your teams a lot, which a lot of sports fans do. It's not really just here. But here's some pictures on the screen of some people that love their sport teams a little too much, right? We got this guy, right? Um, what was funny is when I was picking these pictures on Google, I sat for a second and said, wait a minute, you may know this guy. <laughs> like, I don't know if you do or not, but there's a good chance you're like, oh, hey, there's Bill. Uh, you guys may know this guy, right? But if you ask this guy, hey, what do you love? You're like, well, I love Bama, right? Or this next guy is right here. All right, these guys, very, very clever, roll tide, good job. Uh, but you ask them, what do you love? Man, I love Alabama. This next guy does take the cake, though. Uh, it's a Bear Bryant tattoo on his back. And what's funny is that I, asked, I showed this picture to Chris Richardson the other day. He goes, oh, I know him. And if you've been to Alabama, this guy wears a kilt, apparently. 
And he said that he runs around campus, or he used to uh, a few years ago, with a flag with his shirt off running through campus before games. Uh, this guy loves. You would not say, hey, are you a fan of? You know exactly what he's a fan of. Um, all right, I'm not going to pick on Bama anymore. We'll go to this next one. Um, there you go. You got that tattoo. You got Tumor's Corner. You got that uh, toilet paper roll. And what it says, oh, it's so great. I have to read. I can't see what it says up there. It says, I believe in Auburn, and I love it. And he does, right? And he loves it. That's a question. I'm not saying if you have tattoos of your teams, that's wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you know what these guys love. Uh, or this next guy right here, this next group, uh, he is ready, right? He is ready for the coach to turn around and say, we need you at safety. And he's ready to go, right? The girl, not so much. He's over here texting, but he is ready to lay somebody out on a kickoff, right? He is all for his team or this next car right here. You don't, has, has, has anyone in here seen this car? No? Uh-oh, we got hands in the back. There we go. So, hey, it's a real car. You don't ask them, do you love LSU? No, right? They know exactly what they love, all right? All right, not, I made fun of, uh, not made fun of, that's a strong word, uh, Alabama and Auburn. We'll look at this next one here. We'll go a little bit in Tennessee. Uh, I'm trying to convince Mary Beth to, uh, uh, when I shave this off, maybe go with the power goatee right here and have that, I and mean, it's pretty good. Or this next one right here. Um, me and Steve Graham were talking about wanting to go up to Gunnersville and get a boat and go up to the game. Steve, I found a ride. This guy right here in the front yard or in the backyard said, sweetheart, you know we got that camper, our good old Tennessee camper and the flat tire. I know what to do with it. We're going to build a pontoon boat out of it, and we're going to just cruise around, all right? But if you ask these people, what do you love, you know what they love. It doesn't hide inside of them. And when you love something with all of your heart, other people should be able to see a difference in you. Other people should see a difference. You know what these people love, right? Do people know what you love? I'm not saying sports is a bad thing. I'm not saying hobbies is a bad thing. But do people know that you love the Lord? Is there an outward difference in you? When you love the Lord, what I love is that when we give our life to Christ, when we get in the water and we are baptized and we are buried in the water with our old self and our old sin and we're raised new, we are given a new heart transplant. The same Holy Spirit comes into our heart is the same Holy Spirit that was in Christ when he was raised from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that was with him when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. It's the same Holy Spirit that was given to them, that is given to us in that gift. And praise God for that, that we have a 100% heart transplant, our old heart, into our new heart in him. There's this theory, and please, if you are a, a medical expert, because I am not, please do not write me an email and tell me where I'm wrong. I, I know where I'm wrong. Uh, there's this, there is a theory called living systems theory. Now, it's a bigger theory, but there's a, there's a part of that theory that says that cells, from what I've read, the two articles that I read, which is not on probably a very credited scholarly journal, uh, but says that cells have memory. And when you get an organ transplant, particularly in a heart transplant, that there are still some cells in that heart that have memory from the previous owner. That when you, not, not every single person, but there's been some cases that have been studied, that people that get heart transplants will tend to have memories of the previous owner. That will tend to form habits of the previous heart owner. And will start liking different foods and getting different habits and different memories and different things. They don't understand 100% why. But I love this thought that when we get a heart transplant for God, that we are getting the same memory, that we should change who we are. These people that have a new heart change who they are because of the previous owner. We should change because of our new heart. That we should act different. That we are different. And that we are called to be different. So the question that I ask now and the question at the end 
here is, what is taking up real estate in your heart? What is filling your heart up? Jesus here does not say, love the Lord your God with a little bit of your heart, with some of your heart, with a portion of your heart. He says, with all of your heart. And he means it. And there's something right now that is filling your heart. Our heart is always full. It's not like half, half empty, half full. It's 100% full. And how much of that is the Lord? 2%, 20, 98. It's pretty good, right? And this is something that I can't tell you. I can't sit with you and tell you I know what is filling your heart. You, you have to do that. You have to know what is filling your heart. Uh, hopefully the next few weeks, today, tomorrow, that you take some, some personal one-on-one time with God and really kind of prioritize your life. Because for me, and I know this is going to step on some toes, and I don't mean to do that. I know this is a little touchy subject right here. But for some of us, we may have got it about third or fourth in that deal, right? If we were to bring up people, we were to have a list of, well, this is what I love, right? I remember whenever I put those rings on my wife's finger when we got engaged and when we got married. But I remember putting that ring on my wife's finger, and she could have asked me to run across the state to get her something, and I would have done it. Right? You just have that feeling of, like, I will do anything. Right? And the same thing, whenever you get married, you're up here shaking. You're like, I'll do anything for you. And I would have. And now, we got baby Jack coming in a few weeks in June. I guess more than a few weeks. Oh, more than a few weeks. June. Uh, we got baby Jack coming. Uh, uh, hearing his heartbeat. Seeing ultrasounds. Seeing his foot push out on her belly. And you're like, what is that? Right? So you, you see him and you're like, oh, my goodness. I will do anything for Jack right now. I'll do anything for him. But God has not called me to put Mary Beth and Jack before him. And it takes me a step back and go, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mark 12. Wait a minute. Because that kind of goes against our American values and thoughts. This is my family. I will do anything for my family. Right? I will do anything for my friends. This is my group. This is my family. This is my kids. Some of you right now are saying, I will do anything for my grandkids right now. Right? You're like, forget my kids now. Now I'm on to my grandkids. And I will do anything for my grandkids right now. God did not say, that's fine. You put your grandkids before me. He says, I'm first. That we are to love the Lord the God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. But the crazy thing is, because God knew this was going to happen, God, God knows where our heart wants to go, and our heart wants to go towards our family, it wants to go towards our kids, and it wants to go towards our friends, and towards our jobs, and towards our hobbies. He says, hey, I want you to put me first. We read in 1 John 4, 7 through 8. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. I love this part because God is love. When we read in Mark 12, going to 31, Jesus said, here's the most important one. Now I'm going to give you the second most important one. In verse 31, he says, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus says, here you go. You want to know how to get your life on track? You want to know what the name of the game is now? It's that you give your heart 110% to the Lord. And then you turn around and you love everyone because of that. And if you want to love your spouse better and more, you love God more. If you want to love your kids more, you love God more. You want to love... Love your friends more, love God more. Your church more, love God more. 
Because through him, we learn how to love. Whenever you stand there and you, and you fill your heart with God, and you say, God, I, I just want 100% you, and you stand there and you see the sacrifice that God has given us through his son, and you realize that love and you understand that love, and you are full of that love, then you will turn around and look at your wife and your kids and your spouse, and you will say, I will love you more with more sacrifices because he loved me first. When you look at him, and say, look at the mercy and grace you have shown me because I am broken, because I am not perfect, because you had to send your son for me because I'm those things. But I see the mercy and grace you show me. I will turn around and I will show that to my wife and to my kids, to my family, to my friends, to my church. It's putting it through that Jesus lens, right? Putting it through that God lens. That God sees us for who we really are. And then we turn around with that God lens and we no longer see our friends as friends or our kids as our kids, but we see them as children of God. I think about it like a train. I tried so hard to get a train up here. Uh, we, we couldn't get one. Uh, to, to get a train up here. And a lot of times we put that engine train our God train three or four, but we're going to put our family train first. We're going to put uh, our kids first. We're going to put everything. And then God's probably about third or fourth in that list. But the engine train is not supposed to go third or fourth. It's supposed to go first. It pulls it all. It keeps it all together. It keeps it all on the track. This is not a health and wealth gospel. This is not, if you love that, then your entire life will all be better. But we will love more because he is love and he has loved us first. For some of us here, we're in different spots. We're in different places. Um, that's one reason why I love our church. There are some people here that have been at church their entire life for years and years and years. And there's some that you may be a guest or you may be visiting or you may just happen to find these doors and you need to come in. And this may be your first time ever in church or your second time. God still has this message for you. And, 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 and I know that we're in different places here. And so here in a second, we do an invitation. And you guys, if you've been to church, our church before, you know what an invitation is. The praise team will come up or um, a Kevin will come up and sing here in a second. And we'll all stand at one point and we'll all sing. It'll be great. But for some of you, please don't start you know, getting your Bibles together. Uh, we... We'll do that here in a second. And for some of you right now, you got that God part, fifth, sixth, eighth, fifteenth down the road, and you've never had a heart transplant. You've never said, I, I want my old self gone, and I want to have a new life in Christ, and I want this Holy Spirit heart transplant. We can do that today. Got a baptistry up there. Uh, when we stand and when we sing, I will be down here. A shepherd will be down here. It's not anything scary. We're not going to make you preach. We would love to assist you. We'd love to talk to you about that. We would love to do that. We'd love to help you with that heart transplant. For some of you, you said, hey, I, I, I don't know where to begin, and I need some help in this. I, I, I've already had the heart transplant, but it was years ago, and I really need some help. When we stand and when we sing, I will be down here. A shepherd will be down here. We will also have a shepherd and his wife uh, in that classroom right there. Maybe coming up front is not your deal. You're like, you know what, I, I don't, I don't want to be in front. But we still want to pray and disciple and walk alongside you to live out this Mark 12 verse. Maybe for some of you, standing up and singing is exactly what you need to do. You are praising God for his love, and that is awesome, right? Maybe for some of you, you need to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk with God right now. And so when we stand and sing, I give you permission to get on your knees, to sit down and pray. We will not judge you. We will not make fun of you. This is a safe zone right here. But maybe you need to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with God about getting him where he needs to be in that area from that 2% to 100%. Or it's just singing. Again, we... Would love to assist you in these. We would love to walk alongside you in your journey in this. And if we can assist you in those, please do so as we stand and as we sing. Holiness, holiness is what I love.